Strang Group team, both as research assistant to our visiting professor Ed Balls, and I'm also doing a PhD looking at how the Treasury managed the financial crisis. Um, led by Dr. John Davis, we at the Strang Group look at political leadership and the machinery of government, both past and present, um, through a series of academic teaching, so uh, at master's level research and also events such as this evening. I'd like to give a special thanks to DXC Technology and also the Department of Political Economy here at King's for partnering with us on tonight's event. Uh, we're really grateful for their continued support. Without them, we couldn't do a lot of what we do, so we're very grateful. Um, and tonight is going to be chaired by Dr. John Davis, who's the director of the Strand Group. But without further ado, I would like to give a warm welcome to Sir Dave Ramsden, Deputy Governor, Deputy Governor of the Bank of England and also a visiting professor here at King's who's going to speak to us about monetary policy from end to end. Dave? Thanks very much, Eleanor. And uh, this is my um, first speech in my new role as Deputy Governor for Markets and Banking and as a member of the Monetary Policy Committee. It's a pleasure to be giving it in the newest part of King's College London and in my uh, other role as a visiting professor here at King's. And I'm delighted it's the 25th Strand Group event, showing how this flagship series of policy events has already become well established. Now one of the key differences between my old and my new role is the level of accountability. As Chief Economic Advisor to HM Treasury for the past 10 years, as would be expected under the Civil Service Code, I was generally responsible for giving evidence-based advice to Ministers who are ultimately accountable for their decisions to Parliament and to, pu and to the public. That is very different from my new role in which I am directly accountable to Parliament and the public for decisions taken whether as a member of the NPC the Financial Policy Committee, or the Prudential Regulation Committee. I also have a direct set of prescribed responsibilities under the bank's application to itself of the senior manager's regime, a framework developed to improve accountability at the top of financial services firms. As a key part of that accountability, over the coming years I look forward to giving lots of talks and speeches such as this one to set out the thinking behind decisions and their, their delivery across the full range of mine and the bank's responsibilities. And the bank has quite rightly placed emphasis on the role of communication as a policy tool in its new Vision 2020 strategy, describing our work to as diverse a range of people as possible. Now, of course, I start this new role at an interesting point in time. It's nearly 17 months since the UK voted to leave the EU, and just over 16 months until that decision takes effect in March 2019. In the period since the referendum, we've learned that while Brexit was at one level a binary decision, there are many potential outcomes and paths to those outcomes. Perhaps reflecting this multidimensionality, uncertainty about Brexit seems to be increasing rather than diminishing over time. In the bank's decision-maker panel survey, run jointly with Nottingham University, the share of firms who placed Brexit among the top sources of uncertainty rose from 35% in a survey taken in September 2016 to 40% in August this year, while those who say it's not an important source of uncertainty fell from 23% to 13% over the same per period. Now, Brexit has an important bearing on the bank's pursuit of monetary and financial stability, and it is taking steps to help ensure the necessary adjustment is as smooth as it can be. The Prudential Regulation Authority is engaging proactively and intensively with banks and insurers to ensure their plans are robust to the full range of potential outcomes. The FPC is, is, is focused on its statutory responsibility of identifying and monitoring and taking action to reduce risks. The MPC's focus has been on balancing the trade-off, as required by its remit, between the speed at which inflation returns to target and the support that monetary policy provides to jobs and activity during the adjustment process. 
in the markets and banking area of the bank, for which I have direct responsibility, we are undertaking a series of initiatives which, although not directly related to Brexit, will help ensure stability, improve effectiveness and enable innovation in key parts of the UK's financial system through this period of challenges and opportunities. It's the work of the MPC and of the markets and banking areas of the bank that I'd like to focus on today. In particular, though, the role they play in end-to-end -end monetary policy, which for the purposes of this lecture, I will split into three phases. De define, decide and deliver. Respectively, they refer to the clear specification of the objectives of monetary policy, the setting of policy appropriately to meet those objectives, and the implementation of monetary policy through the bank's operations in financial markets. Let me start with define. The bank's responsibility for monetary stability dates back to at least the Bank Charter Act of 1844, need to get those dates right, when it was given a monopoly on issuing notes in England and Wales. In the intervening period, the bank's monetary policy objective has taken many different forms that have varied in their degree of formality, clarity and success, including the gold standard, membership of Bretton Woods, monetary targets and the exchange rate mechanism. For much of that period, the bank's monetary stability aims lacked definition. As the Governor has recently noticed, this changed with the Bank of England Act of 1980, 1998, which clarified for the first time in three centuries the bank's responsibilities. The end for monetary policy was defined as maintaining price stability, specified in subsequent remits as the pursuit of a symmetric 2% CPI inflation target, and subject to that, supporting the economic policy of the government, including its objectives for growth and employment. The means for getting to that end is the independent set in monetary policy by the MPC. And this represented a major step forward for the clarity, accountability and efficiency of monetary policy, as assessed by the 2013 review of the monetary policy framework by the Treasury. By depoliticising the short-run trade-off between inflation and activity, this arrangement has provided the grounds for the most successful monetary policy regime for the UK thus far. The MPC's flexible inflation targeting framework was further strengthened by the 2013 Treasury review and the following remit update, which effectively completed the contract by further specifying the relationship between the MPC's primary objective for price stability and its secondary objective to support jobs and growth. Though having overseen that 2013 review in my old role, I must declare an interest in judging its contribution. Since then, the remit has explicitly acknowledged that in exceptional circumstances, shocks to the economy may be particularly large, or the, or the effects of shocks may persist over an extended period. In such a period, the MPC must balance the trade-off between the speed with which inflation is brought back to the target and the consideration that should be placed on the variability of jobs and economic activity. Of course, we didn't have Brexit in mind when updating the remit in 2013, but nevertheless, the bank headed into the EU referendum last year with arguably the most clearly defined objective for monetary policy in its 323-year history. And it has been the foundation of the framework the MPC has used to set monetary policy since the referendum result. Although I am joined the committee in September, at the time I joined the bank, the analytical approach and the framework is one that I fully sign up to. So I'd like to just spend a minute setting it out. Fundamental to the way in which the, the MPC has reacted to Brexit is that monetary policy cannot prevent either the necessary adjustment, such as that implied by the movement of the exchange rate, as the UK moves towards its new international trading arrangements, or the weaker income growth that is likely to accompany it. These are real phenomena likely to play out over many years, exactly the kind of thing that monetary policy cannot affect, no matter how often it is asked um, to by some commentators. What the MPC can do is support the economy during the adjustment process. But even in doing that, the committee has faced a trade-off between stabilising inflation on the one hand and output employment on the other. 
And I'd note that this is something the committee was able to anticipate before the referendum. The minutes of the MPC's May 2016 meeting stating that the implications for the direction of monetary policy will depend on the relative magnitudes of the demand, supply and exchange rate effects. And my colleague Ben Broadbent has recently set out in more detail what this means in the particular context of Brexit. True to this statement, the MPC has set monetary policy since the referendum on the basis of its assessment of how those effects are interacting. This is made difficult by the large, uncertain and sometimes offsetting implications of the decision to leave the EU. So it's not surprising that even though all committee members sign up to the framework I've laid out, their individual assessment of the economic outlook has differed along the way. Which brings me to the second phase of end-to-end -end monetary policy, DECIDE. In the MPC's meeting at the start of this month, a majority of its members thought that the evolution of supply and demand was such that the margin of slack in the economy now seemed fairly limited and that underlying inflationary pressure had shown some signs of picking up. As a result, they judged that this would reduce the degree to which it was appropriate for the MPC to tolerate an extended period of above-target inflation and that a small reduction in stimulus was warranted. Notwithstanding this 25 basis point increase, bank rate remains close to its lowest rate in its 323 year history. Now I wasn't in that majority in November, and that wasn't because I disagree with the overall framework for setting monetary policy in this exceptional period, but rather because I have a somewhat different assessment of where the economy is. By way of framing my own decision, let me give a few comparisons to how things might have turned out in the absence of Brexit, for which I will use the MPC's May 2016 forecast as a proxy. GDP growth in the year to 2017 Q2, and that's the latest quarter for which we have a full set of both expenditure and labour market data, and the latest data that was available at the time of the November MPC decision, was 0.8 percentage points weaker than the MPC's May 2016 forecast. Within that, business investment growth was a full 5.2 percentage points lower. Despite the weakness in the output, employment and hours have actually been stronger than expected, meaning productivity growth per hour was 2.2 percentage points weaker in the year to 2017 Q2. Nominal wage growth was 1.5 percentage points weaker than in the pre-Brexit forecast, which coupled with the effects of the depreciation on sterling, uh, on st the depreciation of sterling on inflation meant real wage growth was 2.6 percentage points weaker. So how does this nexus of data fit into my assessment of the economy? Let me start with demand, which is arguably the most straightforward to explain. Although the economy confounded the initial expectations embodied in usually reliable business surveys taken immediately after the referendum, which were implied that growth was headed for negative territory, there's no doubt that demand has now slowed. This can primarily be accounted for by sharp slowdown in consumption growth, from 3.1% as recently as the middle of 2016 to 1.5% in the year to 2017 Q2 the weakest four-quarter growth since 2012. The primary driver of this weakness has been the weakness in real income, itself reflecting the 18% depreciation of sterling from its pre-referendum peak, as financial market participants have reacted to the prospect of Brexit. Working in the opposite direction, we've witnessed a rotation towards other components of demand, while this is a positive development, it hasn't been enough to offset an overall slowing in GDP growth. Business investment has picked up a little to grow at 2.5% in the last year, though this is weaker than the 3.9% growth on average across our G7 counterparts. And the strength of future investment implied by capital goods in the US and Euro area is even stronger. In addition to the decision-making panel survey and findings of the bank's own agents, a range of survey results suggest, suggest that Brexit-related uncertainty is an important factor weighing on business investment in the UK, despite other, otherwise favourable conditions for capital expenditure. Relative to other components of demand, exports have benefited from sterling's depreciation and stronger-than-expected global demand. 
And at the same time, and notwithstanding their role in increasingly integrated global value chains, growth in imports has been sluggish, meaning that net trade has provided support to GDP growth. Taking all of these together leads me to conclude that although the resilience of growth in the wake of the referendum has been welcome, the broad channels through which we would have expected demand to adjust to a vote to leave the EU are now operating. As a result, GDP growth has slowed from average quarterly rates of 0.7% in 2014 and 2015 to 0.4% more recently. And for those of you who, like me, have had at times in their careers to assess and categorise past UK slowdowns as either U or V-shaped, I consider what we are witnessing now as more of a saucer-shaped slowdown and a pretty unusual shape for that in terms of the historical record. Now, given the long horizon over which the effects of Brexit could play out, we are likely to be on the flat part of the saucer for some time, as embodied in the MPC's latest forecast for GDP growth, which remains at 0.4% per quarter over, th over the three-year forecast horizon, conditional on households and companies basing their decisions on the expectation of a smooth adjustment to new trading arrangements. If realised, this will leave the economy about 2% smaller by 2020 than the May 2016 MPC forecast would have implied. And that growth shortfall is in spite of the fact that global growth has strengthened more than expected in the May 2016 MPC forecast. Now, the biggest risk I see to that outlook for demand is around the resolution of the current uncertainty about our eventual trading arrangements and the path that will be followed to reach them. Were that uncertainty to be lifted, I can see the case for why UK whole economy demand could grow more strongly, more in line with, for example, recent manufacturing indicators. Equally, were uncertainty to persist at current levels or even increase further, I could see a case for demand growth and in particular investment growth being weaker. Now, the reaction of the supply side of the economy since the referendum is more open to interpretation. And given the uncertainties, is something I think informed people can have divergent views on. The combination of weak investment, strong growth in employment, weak wage growth and low productivity growth lends itself to two potential explanations. And they are neither mutually exclusive nor exhaustive. In either case, the sign of the response of key variables is the same, make it difficult to pick between them. But the implications for the outlook for spare capacity and inflation differ. The first possibility is that since the referendum, there has already been a material hit to the supply side of the economy in the form of a reduction in total fa factor productivity, or TFP, the efficiency with which companies put their labour and capital inputs to use. This would reduce output per worker and hence real wages. It would also reduce product future pro profitability thus deterring investment. A reduction in TFP would have a lasting effect on productivity, and hence the supply side of the economy, reducing the rate at which it can grow without generating above target inflation. Now, like most economists, I expect Brexit to have a negative impact on TFP for a variety of reasons, including the need to reallocate resources towards supplying new customers or new products, and the general effect of reduced openness. But these are effects that, like the effects of capital deepening on productivity, will tend to either build over the long run or really only take hold after our trading arrangements have changed. So whilst they can be expected to have a material impact on productivity by the end of the MPC's forecast horizon, I'm not convinced they can fully account for the additional weakness in productivity we've already seen. Productivity shrank by 0.2% in the year following the referendum, compared to growth of 0.5% on average in the preceding seven years, itself a very weak rate of growth by historical standards. A second potential explanation for how the supply side data have evolved is that since the referendum, workers have responded to uncertainties about the outlook by showing even more flexibility in their wage demands. People's willingness to accept lower real wages would encourage firms to hoard labour, and shift away from capital expenditure towards labour input for a given unit of output. Such a further increase in labour market flexibility would imply that part of the recent renewed weakness in productivity growth is cyclical, 
meaning there's a bit more room for the economy to grow without generating above target inflation in the medium term. And I attach some weight to the idea that workers have responded to the changing outlook by showing greater flexibility in their wage demands. This would be consistent with a trend I've observed throughout my career and in successive economic cycles in which peaks and troughs in unemployment have been lower in each cycle, at least since the 1980s. Since the crisis, real wage flexibility has been particularly notable and it may have intensified further since the referendum as the unemployment rate has fallen to 4.3%. Now as supporting evidence for this, I point to the fact that the weakness in private sector real wage growth relative to the MPC's May 2016 forecast has been greater than would be required just to match the weakness in productivity growth. And this is in spite of the additional pressure on real income growth from higher import prices over the same period. This may also be working alongside the level of uncertainty to encourage firms to meet output growth using labour rather than undertaking capital expenditure projects. Now, at the margin, the idea that workers are responding to Brexit by showing increased flexibility could mean that there is more room than headline measures of slack suggest for the economy to grow without generating above target inflation in the medium term. Certainly, it would help explain why, despite unemployment being at its lowest level in 42 years, measures of domestically generated inflationary pressure generally remain levels but generally remain below levels that would be consistent with inflation being at the 2% target in the medium term. That includes a wide range of measures shown in this slide, including from unit wage costs, those derived from the consumer price index, and those based on national accounts measures of value added. In turn, the subdued nature of domestically generated inflation is evidence that the current elevated level of headline inflation is attributable to pressure arising from the pass through of the depreciation of sterling. In judging the appropriate balance to be struck when faced with a trade-off between returning inflation sustainably to target and supporting jobs and activity, one must pay close attention to any sign that above target inflation is feeding through to second round effects in domestic costs. So far, that doesn't seem to be the case. In summary, it's difficult to determine precisely why the supply side of the economy has behaved as it has in the period since the referendum. The weakness in real wage growth and the subdued nature of domestically generated inflation mean I'm not yet ready to discount the idea that labour market flexibility is continuing to intensify. If true, it would mean there is, little, there is a little more room than headline measures of slacks suggest for the economy to grow without generating above target inflation in the medium term. For that reason, in our November meeting, I was willing to wait for more evidence on the evolution of wage and domestic cost growth before beginning to withdraw some monetary stimulus. So I voted for no change in bank rate. Now, once the decision is made on policy, attention turns to the final phase of end-to-end -end monetary policy, deliver. A key part of being Deputy Governor for Markets and Banking is responsibility for delivering much of the bank's monetary and indeed financial stability operations. That includes implementing decisions, monitoring market developments, identifying and where appropriate addressing risks to resilience and effectiveness. In many ways, the November MPC decision was a historic change in policy, the first increase in bank rate in over a decade. I remember the previous increase in bank rate well as the July 2007 MPC meeting was the first I attended as the Treasury's representative. A lot else has happened in the intervening 10 years, but from an operational perspective, it was a straightforward change for the markets area of the bank to implement. Bank rate, which is the rate paid on reserve accounts held at the bank by 183 financial institutions, was changed immediately after the MPC's decision and used as a basis for calculating interest due for that day. Because reserves held at the central bank are the ultimate liquid and risk-free asset in any currency, the rate paid on them serves as a reference point for all other overnight interest rates in the money market. As a result, a range of key overnight market rates increased on the day of the MPC's decision, including the sterling overnight index average, SONIA, a key benchmark for our unsecured overnight borrowing and lending, and the repurchase overnight index average, 
Ronia, a key benchmark for overnight borrowing and lending secured against gilt collateral. In the period since the change in bank rate, both Sonia and Ronia have been on average 25 basis points higher than in the month preceding the decision. But effective delivery extends well beyond mechanically changing parameters within our systems. The bank's operations in money, gilt, corporate bond and foreign exchange markets, its operation of the real-time gross settlement RTGS system, all supported by its comprehensive financial and operational risk factors management framework offer us a unique insight into the workings of the financial system. Markets and banking staff are thus able to advise members of the MPC, FPC and PRC about key developments in monetary and financial conditions. Our operations also leave us well placed to assess the resilience and effectiveness of markets and the infrastructure that underpins them. The bank has always stood ready to use its convening powers or, where necessary, intervene directly in order to ensure the smooth functioning of core sterling markets. But this has been given new impetus in recent years as initiatives such as the Open Forum and the Fair and Effective Markets Review made clear that the bank considers scanning the horizon for emerging vulnerabilities as important as stepping in when risks are crystallised. Working to improve and monitor resilience and effectiveness is something I consider to be a core part of delivering not only monetary but also financial stability. And I believe the bank's work in this area will play an important role in ensuring that the UK has a resilient, effective and innovative financial system as it leaves the EU. There are two ongoing initiatives to enhance financial infrastructure that I'd like to draw attention to in the rest of my remarks today. Both demonstrate the bank's willingness to define ourselves in terms of best practice of governance and transparency and our ongoing commitment to working closely with end users of this infrastructure. Now the first is the reform of the SONIA overnight interest rate benchmark. In April next year the bank will take on end-to-end -end administration of this key market benchmark which is also a critical input to the MPC and FPC's assessment of conditions in sterling money markets. The key outcome of the reform will be to improve the sustainability and representativeness of this piece of infrastructure by using a broader data set covering both brokered and bilateral transactions, collecting as part, as part of the bank's sterling money market data collection. Following the implementation of SONIA reforms, the bank will publish an assessment of its compliance with the IOSCO principles for financial benchmarks alongside an external assurance report. And consistent with those principles, a SONIA oversight committee comprising of a mix of bank and independent members will provide scrutiny on all aspects of the benchmark. And importantly, a more robust SONIA provides markets with a credible alternative to sterling LIBOR as a key reference rate and benchmark. Indeed, SONIA has recently been confirmed as the market's preferred alternative rate by the Sterling Risk-Free Rate Working Group. That is a necessary step in ending the current over-reliance on LIBOR. Developing alternatives to LIBOR and similar benchmarks and encouraging their use has been a key priority of the international financial community since the Financial Stability Board, chaired by the Governor, published its report on interest rate benchmark reform in 2014. But the importance of this work has grown as it has become increasingly apparent that transactions underlying LIBOR are at best scarce, resulting concerns about the medium-term sustainability of LIBOR, set out, by a set out a speech by Andrew Bailey in the summer, highlight the need for a transition away from LIBOR to alternative benchmarks. And as we move to the next phase of benchmark reform work, a broad-based transition to SONIA, it is clear that active engagement will be needed from participants across all relative, relevant sectors and markets. As a result, the Bank and FCA are currently finalising plans to broaden the mandate and membership of the Sterling Risk-Free Rate Working Group. The second ongoing initiative I'd like to draw attention to is the renewal of the Real-Time Growth Settlement System, RTGS, which is the means by which central bank reserves are transferred between banks, big and small, across the financial system and settles around £600 billion of transactions per day. 
The world of payments is one which has undergone many changes in its long history. From the idea in the 1770s that a single central location, the Five Bells Tavern, which once stood on Lombard Street, should be nominated as a meeting point at which to settle obligations, through to the launch of 19, in 1996 of real-time gross settlement in the UK. 250 years on, we're currently living through another period of innovation, as fintech has enabled payments to be coupled, decoupled from traditional banking services. Now, the aim of the RTGS renewal programme is to deliver a more resilient, flexible and innovative sterling settlement system. And by doing so, we will help ensure the UK remains a world leader in payment systems. As well as providing a strong underpinning for monetary stability, RTGS will promote competition and strengthen financial stability. The programme will run over a period of years, but some key features have already been delivered, including the opening up of access to RTGS to non-bank payment providers who have been able to apply for accounts with RTGS since July. One particularly noteworthy milestone was reached last Monday when the bank began to provide the direct delivery of the high-value payment system, CHAPS, the workings of which are shown in this Vision 2020-style graphic on our website. This brought to an end the split of responsibilities between CHAPSCO, the private sector administrator of the scheme, up until the Friday before last Monday, and the bank, which has provided the underlying infrastructure in the form of the overall RTGS system. Although this split had its merits historically, the changing scale, nature and sophistication and of cyber and other threats to the stability of payment systems mean there is a compelling financial stability case for being able to provide end-to-end -end risk management within one organisation, the Bank of England. In recent months, the bank has worked closely with the shareholders, users, management staff of Chapsco to bring about a smooth and orderly transition and avoid any disruption to the service provided. On Monday last week, former Chapsco staff took their new seats in the Bank of England and by 7am, more than 22,000 transactions have been completed on the bank's infrastructure, with a value of 11 billion. In the first week in total, approximately 862 transactions were completed with a value of one and a half trillion pounds, including wholesale interbank payments, mortgages, <coughs> company invoices, and much more. In short, it was business as usual for banks and their customers. Like our administration of Sonia, the combined RTGS and CHAP service will benefit from best practice governance arrangements, including a new board which will meet for the first time in December, chaired by me, and with four independent members recruited through a transparent and competitive process. We will also continue to benefit from the voice of CHAP's users through the establishment of a new strategic advisory forum for senior industry rep representatives. Let me conclude by recapping on how I see end-to-end -end monetary policy. The well-defined objectives of monetary policy have provided a strong foundation on which the MPC can base its decisions over the course of the crucial period up to and beyond the UK's withdrawal from the EU. But to be successful, monetary and indeed financial stability policy must be effectively delivered. That requires the efficient implementation of decisions and it requires stable and effective call cool sterling markets and payments infrastructure. The bank has a long history of outstanding execution of de decisions, of scanning the horizon for emerging vulnerabilities in markets and of using its position to address them. In keeping with this history, these are things I will prioritise in my term as Deputy Governor for Markets and Banking. And beyond define, decide and deliver, there's another D, describe. Improving our communications internally and externally is a key priority of the bank's Vision 2020 strategy because better communication will support our mission to deliver monetary and financial stability as efficiently as we can. A new focus of our communication is on schools. We, st um, we started this new focus last week in Merseyside and over the next year, bank staff are visiting 200 schools, covering 9% of the pupil population. But engaging with more traditional stakeholders remains important. On which note, let me stop and take some of your questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, thanks very much for that, Dave.
Um, I know Dave is keen to see questions and also uh, was keen to particularly encourage current students as well. Um, okay, can I have name and can I have institution and keep it pithy? I saw two questions over, the, over here, please. Apparently, if you press a button in front of you, you can oh. amplify. Okay, institution, the Observer newspaper, and the Strand Group. Um, I agreed with Dave's vote the other day. That we were in a minority. <laughs> but what, I wonder what you make of some of the stuff currently on CBI. That if um, industry is finding it, in, uh, is finding that nobody's coming over from the European Union and lots of people are fleeing, there are suggestions that people are worried that that could suddenly have um, quite a marked effect on wage demand, wage demands. Um, we, I mean. It's very good to get a question, uh, first question for a fellow visiting professor, <laughs> Professor Keegan. Um, I mean, for me, it really, it really comes back to the framework, which I do think has served um, the, the Bank of England well since, the MPC well since before the referendum, uh, and very explicit in that, emphasising its demand, but it's also supply, and it's the impact on the exchange rate. So the kind of considerations you're flagging, Bill, around you know, what's going to happen to the supply of labour would very much come into the assessment of supply. In, in the November inflation report, um, we saw a pickup in potential and actual productivity, some ongoing growth in the workforce, but less than in the past, I think, that gives a, um, gives a, you know, a, if you like, a potential growth rate, what, what we called in our new, I think, I can't remember if it was level one or level two communication, you know, a, a sort of speed limit to the economy of one and a half percent, rather lower than um, um, what, we were, what we were used to, certainly before the financial crisis. And so I guess the final point is, yes, we've got these factors from Brexit, I've emphasised some of them why I think it might be a more of a cyclical uh, issue at the moment on productivity than a structural one. Um, then we've got the additional determinants of potential supply. But this is, a, it is worth remembering that these Brexit effects, however they play out, are reinforcing a kind of pattern of developments that we've seen since the, really since the financial crisis, particularly in terms of relatively weak productivity growth. Hence why the speed limit is so low uh, relative to where it was in the past. But it is still growth of 1.5%. There was a question there. Thank you. Uh, Fabrice Montagne, I'm Chief Economist with Barclays. Um, <coughs> Chief Economist for the UK, sorry. Uh, um, thank you very much for your presentation. I had a question regarding uh, one of your MPC colleagues, uh, Jan Flieger, put forward um, the re-leveraging of consumers. And I was wondering, because you're describing a situation where consumers or workers are happy to, um, to accept more flexibility in their wages, but it seems they're not happy to adjust the level of consumption. Hence, we're seeing either, I mean, relative to their wage, right? That's why we're seeing saving rates lower um, how, and, and leverage, leverage level increasing again. I mean, how does that fit in your assessment is that a cyclical behaviour, or, I mean, I would be curious. Um, so, in terms of where the overall household to debt to income ratio is, um, it, it is still markedly below where it was post-crisis. Can't, can't remember the exact, uh, how much it's fallen, but it's fallen markedly. It has started to creep up in the most recent um, quarters, which I guess is what Yang Yan was flagging. That is, it, it's in, if you strip out um, student loans, the increase in it is not as as not as great. But it, it has started to to um, creep up. But as I say, it remains below um, the level it got to post the financial crisis. I mean, from my sort of looking at how the labour market has interacted with um, uh, the income balances, if you like, of the different sectors in the economy over, over a few decades, 
Um, and what also we know about, you know, what are the biggest drivers of household behaviour and household vulnerability. Um, having a job is, if you like, the key driver. Um, so the fact that wages are relatively uh, weak, you know, continuing a trend that we've seen since the financial crisis, but where, whereas I, whereas I flagged in my speech, um, the behaviour of real wages have been particularly marked since the referendum. The fact, though, that over that time, 300,000 jobs have been created is, means, for me, I can, I can square you know, those different factors, as it were. Um, but, but that's not to say that, you know, whether it's on um, you know, the Monetary Policy Committee, but also on the Financial Policy Committee, we're obviously very interested. We keep a very close eye on those 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 leverage measures, but I would I think the final thing I would stress is that the household debt to income ratio is still materially down on where it was post crisis, and it's it's creeping up, but it's not it's not moving up sharply. Ah, oh. so David, um, first many congratulations on your first speech. Really good, and I particularly like. Um, I think it's really great what you're doing on Sonia and the CHAP system. Um, I gave you advance notice of my question, which is, when did the Bank of England stop targeting inflation? And with hindsight, do you agree that there are institutional risks in a central bank targeting output and employment? Um, as the... Um as the steward of the Treasury for how many years, Nick? <laughs> I can't remember. Um, you know, you're, you're... Eleven. Eleven. <laughs> beating, beating my time as Chief Economic Advisor Only by, just. by nine, and my time as Director General by, 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 by one year, since I did that for ten years. You and I both know then, through that time, that throughout that time, the, the, the remit that we gave to the um, Bank of England uh, was constant in that throughout that time, we, in, in the sense that we said it was important that an inflation, the inflation target of 2% was targeted at all times. And that's exactly what the um, MPC has been framed by in its decisions. And as I said in my speech, I think it's been uh, arguably... Um, I, certainly over my working uh, career, it's been the most successful framework that we've had. I think inflation um, over that period has probably averaged around 2%, which is the target. So I, I, I wouldn't really recognise the premise of your question. Um, equally, you were still Permanent Secretary uh, when I produced um, the review of the monetary policy framework with, I think, I can't remember if my Treasury colleagues here were involved in that, where we um, recognised that this trade-off between the primary <coughs> objective uh, to achieve price stability and the secondary objective uh, to stabilise um, volatility in output and jobs, that there might be exceptional circumstances where the, um, the trade-off that was struck, and particularly the horizon over which inflation was brought back to target uh, might need to be lengthened in order to uh, uh, dampen down the volatility that there would be an output if it was brought back to target more quickly. And as I said, you know, in 2013 we didn't foresee the range of shocks that were were coming. And I would stress that I think Brexit is multi-dimensional, so it's a process with different shocks hitting demand, supply, and the exchange rate at different times. But absolutely, I think the bank has um, operated within that framework that it's been given um, to, you know, to manage this trade-off between price stability, the primary objective, and the secondary objective. And, and I think um, we we'll see from the latest um, uh, inflation report forecasts um, that were conditioned on um, bank rate rising to... 1% by the end of the forecast horizon. That's what was implicit in the yield curve uh, on, on which those forecasts were based. That by the end of the forecast period, 
conditioned on that yield curve, inflation is back at 2.1%. So, um, you know, back very close to target. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chen Patel, friend of the Sound Group and strategist in the city. Um, I was intrigued, I was surprised by the 25 base points hike when it happened, and I just wondered what effect can 25 base points do on the market where we are? What's the main signal? How do you know it worked? And also the reaction function when your Brexit led to the devaluation or depreciation in the currency. Um, if you get hard Brexit, what are the scenarios? So if you go back to 120 on cable or whatever, or even lower, um, what are the scenarios in terms of your inflation, headline inflation, how high could it go? And would you be comfortable running sort of that high inflation at very low rates? So, I mean, the first question I, I tried to answer, or partly in my remarks, um, in that the overnight <coughs> rates, which are the immediate transmission of um, the bank rate increase through to markets, those both immediately moved up. And then when you look at um, they moved up and they've stayed up by 25 basis points. And then when you look at then uh, um, looking further out across the yield curve, you can see that um, I think at the moment, just looking at where things were in the course of today, another, and yeah, this is where the, the market's current expectations, um, another increase in bank rate is priced in by the end of next year, I think. Um, and then one, one more one by, by 2020, by the end of 2020. So that's reasonably conditioned, that's reasonably consistent with the yield curve that we, we base the, um, the November projections on. So for me, in terms of the, 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 the mechanics of the market, um, that has all worked, you know, the, 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 the immediate passing through into, into overnight rates has worked well. In terms of, you know, there's a kind of wider question as to the kind of impact it's had in the economy, and we set out very clearly in the inflation report that we did think it was going to, um, uh, you know, in the governor's phrase it, phrase, it was taking our foot off the accelerator a bit. It would have an impact on, on demand in the economy, um, and we factored that into our projections. In terms of your longer, your, your second point, which is looking ahead, and obviously you know we are where we are only two and a half weeks after, um, after the November monetary policy decision. My first, my second one that I, I got to vote in after attending about a hundred as the Treasury's representative. Um, you know what we will do in terms of the way we on the monetary policy committee approach Brexit. We'll have this framework, which I think has served us well, of demand, supply, and the exchange rate. But it won't be based on our view of what we think is going to happen. It will be based on our assessment of what is happening, and then our projections of how that will, that will pass through the economy. So at the moment, we are very clear that our projections are based on the assumption that there is a smooth transition to an end state, and that because that end state has not been specified, we're effectively taking an average of the possible end states. So you've got two sets of assumptions. You've got one about the transition path. And we're making that assumption because it seems to us, based on survey and other evidence, that that's what consumers and businesses are assuming. And then, you know, as, but as we move through time, we will learn more, and both about the transition, you know, in the coming period, we, we, you know, we, we may learn more and more as each week passes, but we'll learn more about the transition and we'll learn more about the end state. Um, and, you know, Ben, and one of my, Ben Broadbent, one of uh, the other deputy governors, he set out in a speech last week what some of the outcomes could be in terms of how, the, how you know, you were talking about where the exchange rate could go under certain scenarios. And, you know, you can, you can surmise what the policy reaction might be if we didn't think in under certain scenarios that inflation was going to get you know sustainably back to target over over the horizon that we tend to look at even in these exceptional circumstances then you could you know you could imagine a world where uh, policy had to be tighter than was um, was um, implicit in the yield curve at present but yeah, that's for the future 
and I'm not going to anticipate, you know, there's so many uncertainties, as I've said, it's multi-dimensional, multi-dimensional about how Brexit is going to play out. Martin. Mine is in some sense, sorry, Martin Wheel uh, from uh, <coughs> DPE and Business School. Uh, in some sense, a follow-on to Nick's question, <coughs> how often do you think the MPC can talk about exceptional circumstances before exceptional circumstances become the norm? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I'll keep, I'll, I'll make my answer short. I think it is legitimate to talk about the current circumstances as exceptional. I mean, when I was putting together um, with colleagues in the Treasury the review of um, how the framework, the flexible inflation targeting framework, had operated uh, from from '92, and then after it was codified in '97 through until 2013, you know, we had in mind a reasonably conventional set of shocks, you know, supply shocks, demand shocks, something such as Brexit where you can have um, shocks of different nature happening in, you know, in series as well as in parallel, I think legitimately counts as exceptional. Um, even within that circumstance, though, for the majority of the MPC, their tolerance for higher inflation relative to a degree of spare capacity was exhausted. So, you know, there was a small increase in, in bank rate in November. So even within exceptional circumstances, um, the MPC, uh, the majority of the MPC has uh, voted to put up bank rates, so we put up bank rates. So I think, you know, we'll, we will keep this, keep this under review. I think as we... Um, you know, we will learn more, I would expect, over the coming weeks and months. And that will, you know, we will factor that into our decision making within the framework that I've discussed. I mean, actually, the demand, demand supply and exchange rate is also a framework that can work outside exceptional. So it covers most of, most of the things that go on in the economy. Um, and, you know, that, but, but it, I think it is particularly useful at present, given, given the shocks that are hitting the UK. Yes, please. Uh, hi, uh, Yusuf, second year PPE student at King's. Uh, you touched on the fact that the bank is allowing uh, non-bank payment service providers access to RTGS. Could you outline the, um, the impact of that on the payment sector and uh, what the bank is doing to promote the fintech revolution? Um, very good question. Um, well, I mean, just by... I mean, we, we published for real-time growth settlements, um, we published a blueprint for how we saw the renewal going. Um, what we're now doing is, if you like, you know, we published that back in the spring, I think May. Now we're filling in the details there. But one of the guiding principles of that was that we should, you know, it should be more open to a wider range of users. We, we actually, within that blueprint, we ruled out building the new technology um, that, uh, that RTGS is going to run on, being done on a kind of um, blockchain distributed ledger type approach so we decided that that tech, that that fintech type revolution was not mature enough um, for us in the central bank providing a kind of bit of critical national infrastructure to you know to move you know to move um, to be at the frontier as it were with that but we wanted to keep open uh, the optionality down the line to make sure that whatever technological solution we do go for, through and we're we're working um, in detail on that. That we will, you know, that it will be, it will be able to um, uh, operate with blockchain type technology. Well, uh, sorry, distributed ledger type technology. In the interim, we are opening up um, RTGS to a broader range of payment service providers. They still have to pass quite stringent criteria to be accepted into the system, as you'd expect, because you know, the, um, the system will only be as strong as its um, 
you know, its its newest or its least developed member. Um, but you know, we're, we're you know, we are we are very keen to make sure that we are uh, through the way de we develop our TGS, we are not putting um, you know viable um, members at a, at, a, at a disadvantage, you know, in excluding them, and also that also helps with competition in the sector. But this is very much an evolutionary process. Obviously, the retail payments, because what we're talking about here is a wholesale system, the retail payment service providers have also got their own parallel, um, their very significant initiative where they're consolidating how they do retail payments. Um, but you know, something, something I'm very focused on this delivering this kind of thing is new, newer to me compared to most of what I've been talking about today. But very much with a view, as I was saying, that we, you know, we want to be making sure that the UK's settlement system remains at the leading edge. So that's why we need that kind of optionality and also why we need to be not just alive to fintech revolution, but if you like, sort of um, embracing it in the, in the future. Okay. Question mark. Oh, I'm Steinring, and uh, I'm yet another visiting professor around here. Uh, I'm not sure if we're in a majority or a minority. <laughs> no, we are a majority, but we're okay. We're doing okay as a majority. Minority. Um, you've explained uh, that the bank is making plans for different possible outcomes of the Brexit process to be prepared for different <coughs> contingencies. Now, does that include in the bank's thinking also the potential that Brexit does not happen? And does the bank have plans for that eventuality? We've, in our work on um, thinking through scenarios, this is both from the kind of, as I said right at the outset of my remarks, both from a kind of our role um, on the macro prudential side through the Financial Policy Committee and then on the micro prudential side through the Prudential Regulation Committee that oversees the work of the Prudential Regulation Authority. We're very much focused on, on the resilience of the system or of individual um, institutions, banks, insurance companies, and the risks thereof. So we're very much focused on, um, our scenarios tend to be focused on things that would generate uh, you know, a particular set of risks. We don't look quite completely across you know, the broadest possible range of uh, scenarios that some outside our domain might focus on. We're very much focusing on you know, the assumptions we are given that Brexit is going to happen, that we're going to leave um, you know, the EU in March 2019. And then, as I've said, there are different um, assumptions and scenarios one can make about the transition through that period and then about the end state. But that's, the, that's if you like, the population of, of scenarios and risks that we, we are um, focused on. I'm Ben Schomburg with Reuters. Um, just a quick question about the uh, November 3rd, I think it was, announcement. Second. Um, second, sorry. Um, it's unusual when a central bank raises interest rates in the, the, the currency falls. Were you surprised by that? And does that sort of speak to the difficulties of communicating with financial markets in these exceptional times? Um, I'm tempted to fall back on a line I always used to use in my old role, that you never comment on the <laughs> exchange rate. Um, but, uh, but just to sort of expand a bit on that, I think in the run-up to the, um, uh, the meetings, in the course of the previous week or two, um, sterling had risen quite a bit. So, um, uh, and also um, yields had risen. Um, so there was quite a lot of anticipation um, and um, analysis of positioning of, of where uh, people in the markets were had suggested under certain scenarios what we saw might happen. Um, you know, but where we are, actually what, where I think um, even on the day Sterling was very close to the conditioning, even though it fell a bit, it was very close to the conditioning assumption we'd made, uh, the 15-day average for the inflation report forecast. And um, 
it's been pretty stable since. So. Uh, Peter Hayden, a uh, friend of the Strand Group, um, you said uh, and illustrated that uh, the traditional indicators that you look at uh, were showing that there was no traditional pressure for um, for exchange rate movement given given the, the traditional certainly domestic supply side pressures that you would normally expect to see, which is why you voted to uh, keep the uh, keep the interest rate level. Uh, Professor Keegan agreed with you, which is all the proof proof we needed that you were right and everyone else was wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> one of the indicators that everyone sees is the uh, increasingly loud clicking, no, uh, ticking clock, and I'm uh, interested to know to what to what extent uh, pressure to move exchange rates is driven by that ticking clock. Because if they don't go up, you won't be able to drop them again after the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> um. <laughs> I mean, just to be, um, just to clarify, we, um, the indicators that I showed were mainly indicators of domestic inflationary pressure, which, as I said, were, well, the chart shows that they were, most of them were actually slightly below the levels that they had um, in, in the seven years running up to the financial Crisis. So none of that. Whether they're kind of labour market-based measures, CPI-based um, uh, measures, or GDP-based measures of uh, domestically generated inflation, Martin will be familiar with these suite of measures from his old role on the MPC. Um, so it was. Those were the. Those for me were indicators that there um, is still some slack in the economy. It's also possible um, that you know, the relationship between slack and wages uh, as the main domestic pressure has changed, something that my colleague John Cunliffe uh, gave a speech about last week. Um, and so that, you know, that for me was why there wasn't sufficient evidence for me to vote for a rate rise, but obviously the majority of the MPC um, felt differently and voted differently. I mean, it's worth, and, and it's worth recalling that, you know, they've, um, uh, you know, they, that, m that many of them have been looking at these indicators over a period of time. And if you look at the shorter horizons, for example, for wage pressure, um, you know, three-month on three-month rates, the kind of thing I think Martin, as I recall, when I used to be the Treasury representative, uh, and I'd listen to Martin at the MPC, you'd look at indicators like that because you're, because some of the longer, you know, the the year-on-year -year measures, they've got quite a lot of history in them. Whereas the shorter, me shorter term measures, might be telling you what's happening now. Um, but these are also, I mean, I would want to stress that we're all operating within the same framework of thinking about how much spare capacity there is there, which means what's the difference between demand and supply, what's its impact on price pressures in the economy. So these are. You know, these are differences of interpretation and often of things which are not observable. I mean, you can observe the wage data, but, you know, the degree of spare capacity is something you have to make an assessment of because supply, you know, demand is observable to the extent that, you know, one can accept the ONS's numbers for demand, but supply is, is something that is, is assessed. So these are, you know, these are differences of interpretation and assessment. Um, and, and that was, you know, I, I had a somewhat different view, so voted in the way that I did. But I wouldn't sort of want to, you know, you know sort of imply, rather as you were, that there were some kind of bigger differences going on. Thank you. Uh, Richard Roberts. Richard Roberts, uh, DPE. Um, I would have, uh, the, for the, the way I see it, that um, I think it's extremely likely we will have a very significant correction in the U.S. Uh, stock market in the foreseeable uh, future. Is that a scenario that, um, which will be a significant external shock, which will then obviously have consequences on the market? Is that a, a, a risk that um, is perceived at the, at the bank? Um. I'm not going to show you a slide. I'm just going to move on back to my. Uh, sorry, just I thought, just thought you'd all be getting bored with a picture of chaps. 
no, how dare you? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not bored of it at all. I'm very, I had two dates when I joined the, uh, in, in my diary when I joined, got my new job. One was my Treasury Select Committee um, hearing, which was on October the 17th, and the other was um, um, our plan to bring Chapsco, deliver Chapsco on, uh, uh, into the bank uh, on November the 13th. So, um, anyway, back to your question. <laughs> um, no, we, we um, and actually I flagged this in um, uh, my written evidence to the, um, to the Treasury Select Committee. Um, I was asked what did I see as the risks to um, financial stability from the perspective of being a new member of the FPC. And I did flag, just as the FPC has, that um, in its... Um, September meeting minutes that when you have uh, riskier assets um, um, at these kind of valuation levels, not necessarily equities, the kind of things we had in mind of more, um, particularly the you know, in the US rather than the UK actually, where riskier assets um, are being valued rather differently. Um, you know, you can have the you can have the position that riskier assets are, with, with very low um, bond yields and long-term interest rates, um, people can be valuing their future earnings prospects um, rather higher. They're not having to discount them as much. Um, but if, like me, you think that actually the reason that long-term interest rates, um, real rates are so low, might have something to do with weaker growth prospects. You know, there's a risk that there's a, you know, there's a kind of inconsistency there. You know, are, you, are, are those valuations taking account of um, those potentially weaker growth prospects? So, um, so I've, I'm, I've, flagged, I've flagged that risk of, a, of, of there being a sort of potential vulnerability um, in, in current valuations. Thank you. Please. Uh, Gemma from the Financial Times. Um, Dave, you referred uh, just then to um, uh, Mark Carney's statement about easing foot off the accelerator. What's the MPC's current thinking on the equilibrium rate of interest? So in other words, when, at what level of interest rates does your foot hover over the brake pedal? Um, I think it's... Um, I mean, it goes back to the previous answer in that I think the, the, the kind of equilibrium rate, whether you call it R star or, or some variation of that, capital R star or lower R star, um, is, is likely to be materially lower than it was pre-crisis. Um, I'm not going to, <laughs> this early on in my, um, in my term, I'm not going to start trying to, um, you know, suggest where it might be um, now. Um, I think one thing that um, and other MPC members have talked about this recently, I mean certainly at least globally you might be thinking that with the kind of better global prospects that I have flagged a couple of times as in my remarks um, and in other you know, evidence I've given to the TSC and the like, <coughs> Um, you know, seems to have been a trend of the last year, a year and a half, a pick up in global prospects. You can imagine my, why, from whatever level it was at, Global R Star might be starting to show some life. There's then a question of where, where that leaves domestic, you know, UK rates. But I'm not going to be drawn on a, a, on a, on a, on a precise point for now. A very warm evening to everyone and thank you for that really, really informative talk. Um, I'm Amrita Raja from the Department of Political Economy at King's College London. Um, so my question is uh, rather on uh, like, you know, how the how there is a lot of speculation and a lot of conjecture about the dynamics between the cent uh, central bank and the government and we as students have always been 
you know, we've been taught about this and we've always heard about the to and fro rift that goes on between the two institutions. So my question to you would be like, how far has your experience been and what uh, what kind of experiences have you had um, had to have with uh, the Theresa May government and uh, how, how often do you, uh, do you like think that the government should also be... Um, you know, doing its bit when it comes to uh, the the economy and its state at this point in time? Um, <laughs> so I stopped being a Treasury employee on the 1st of September, so I had, before that I had 29 years of, um, of um, observing the relationship between the Treasury and the Bank of England from that side, and I've had two and a half months um, from the bank side, and I mean, it, seriously, I mean, the, um, the first part of my um, speech this evening was 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 really sort of um, making the case for why the, the 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 overall framework, which is set by the government through the annual remit um, that it sets for. Um, not just the Monetary Policy Committee, but also it now sets an annual remit for the Financial Policy Committee, and it has started to write a letter once a Parliament to the Prudential Regulation Committee, um, sets out the bank, sets out the government's objectives and where it sees the bank <coughs> fitting within that. I think that provides a really well codified um, basis within which the bank operates um, according to a principle that I think it was the previous governor Mervyn King called um, constrained discretion and from my perspective um, but I also think you know the governor talked about this um, it uh, didn't talk about it actually at your 20th anniversary event for the MPC but it did at the, the conference we had back in September yeah I think there's a general view that 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 framework has worked well and within that there is a huge amount of engagement that we have um, you know us with our responsibilities whether as the Bank of England for what we do to make decisions on things other than the, the policies where we work, make them within the, the remits that I've said set and with the with the Treasury and other bits of um, government um, I mean just today to give you an example um, we sent a, the governor sent a letter to the uh, to the chancellor saying that we um, our latest um, assessment of where where the term funding scheme was going to end up mean that we needed an increased indemnity on the term funding scheme. We got a letter back from uh, the chancellor of the Exchequer increasing the indemnity. So it's just an example of the kind of interaction we have. That's quite a sort of strategic interaction, but day in day out. Um, you know, us achieving our objectives for monetary and financial stability, the government achieving its much, trying to achieve its much wider set of objectives. Okay, we've got time for one very last quick question. So David Robinson of Market News. The current market expectations, bank rate goes to 1% over three years, 1.25 or something over five. You have no QE unwind in your guidance until it reaches 2%. So that's effectively no QE unwind in the foreseeable future. Are you comfortable with that? Um, I, I think I'd just reiterate, um, if you like, the two principles that we have. Sorry, I'm trying to see past you, past John. To, the two principles that we framed um, our approach to QE um, since late 2015, uh, where we where the MPC set out guidance. One was um, that given the track record of how bank rate has operated over decades, if not centuries, bank rate um, was, as we said, in 2015 and is remains the marginal instrument in terms of um, implementing monetary policy. And the considerations for um, unwinding QE, the second principle, those um, won't come into play until bank rate has reached a level from which it can be materially cut. 
and the kind of history of cycles is that that's um, around 150 basis points or so. Um, you, you know, that would be, I think that's what the, um, the empirical work that the bank did to underpin that guidance from the MPC. That remains, the, you know, those two principles remain the framing. Okay, well, that brings us to an end. Uh, it was quite a wonderful uh, evening. Um, can I say a very big thank you to all of you coming at relatively short notice um, and for in really engaging too. If uh, any of you were in any doubt that this was um, uh, uh, of real importance, the Telegraph have already uh, put you up. Uh, UK workers too cautious to ask for pay rises, says New Bank England guru Dave Ramsden. There we go, so you've got plenty of that over the next day. And, and from our point of view, we're looking forward to it. Okay, so.